thing, and I was just, I was thinking that, you know, during that song, uh, it is well with my soul. If you, if you know the history of that song, and I encourage you to go home and research that sometime, but, you know, a man wrote that who had lost his family coming across the Atlantic, and he went back to that spot in the Atlantic where they, where the ship sunk, and he, and he prayed to God, and he wrote that song. I can remember when my dad had, uh, had passed. The, the song that we, uh, we, we sang at his, uh, his memorial service, his, his celebration of life, was It Is Well With My Soul. And, and, and you know, when I brought me to tears here right when I heard that now, but Lee hit the nail on the head, and Ron hit the nail on the head. Our lives are going to end, and they are. You know, we're, we only have so much time. That's, that's, that's a fact. Well, that moment, when, when, when you stop breathing here on earth, you will, you will continue to breathe one of two places. You will either walk in the presence of the one true God, if you know him as your Lord and Savior, or you will be separated from him from all eternity and having nothing but suffering and destruction. I know for a fact my dad's walking to talk to the Lord. My mom's there. It is well with my soul today. He called him home, right? And I'm sure I know Charlie, and Charlie's a, a neat guy. Man, I, I love Charlie. Yeah. Um, and I, I know Charlie's walking to talk to the Lord right now. Yeah, well, that's powerful when we know that. So as we uh, go into our message today, I'm going to ask you to turn into 2 Peter chapter 1. That's kind of where the, the, the main idea of our message is going to come out of. So turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, if you would. And uh, I'm going to put a picture on the screen here in a second in, um, of, of Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill, and, and, and there he is, um, he, he gave a famous speech right before uh, the Battle of Britain. And a woman by the name of Queen Elizabeth had given a very similar speech called the Tilbury speech, right before the Spanish Armada. And Queen Elizabeth made this statement, and Winston Churchill made the same statement. No matter what else happens, no matter if no one else stands for England, we will stand alone against any invader. We will stand strong, we will stand firm, and we will stand in the power that we have as Englishmen. That was a powerful speech. I mean, Queen Elizabeth rallied the nation of England to defeat the Spanish Armada with that speech. Winston Churchill rallied the nation of England to defeat the, the, the blitz that was coming from the Nazi war machine. And the reason I want you to think about that is we are in a time in our history as believers that we need to realize we might end up standing alone. Are we willing to stand alone on the word of God. I thought about that song that we all sang, the B-I-B-L-E, when we were children. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I'll stand alone on the word of God. As we start to bring our Developing a Heart for God series will close. And if you've missed any of those prior messages, I really encourage you to go back to our Target One Facebook page or our YouTube page, Target One Ministries YouTube page, and watch those four previous messages that lead up to this one. Because if you do, that, that enriches your faith. Because we're talking about transformation is what we're talking about. But I also want you to understand, we are going to build our life. Everyone is going to build your life on one of two things. See, everyone trusts something. You are either going to trust man's word, which is a fact that it's called a secular view of life. You're going to trust those people in the media, you know, those people who have said, yeah, do this, do that, do that. Your inner feelings, you're, you're going to you're live by your lust and your desires and what I think is right, or you're going to walk by what God's word said. It's one or the other. There's no in-between ground. You can't have a foot in God's word and a foot in the secular world. It's not going to work that way. It's important for us to understand that something that we center our belief system on, you're, you're going to center it on something. It's either going to be on God's word or on man's word. See, we choose to believe in the Bible. And I want to ask you, why do you choose to believe in the Bible? 
And for the most Christians, if you would have most Bible-believing, and remember, I, I believe that a Bible-believing Christian is someone who's accepted Christ in their life. It's just not someone who says, well, I'm, I believe there's a God, and I go to church every now and then. Well, and, and now and then I'm going to pray for my food. That's not, a, that's not a believer. A believer is someone who says, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ into my life. I humble myself. I lay myself down and say, Lord, you come into my life like Romans 10 tells us as we walk that Romans word. That, that's a believer. The Spirit of God now lives into you. It breathed into you. Now you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if I would ask most, uh, most believers... You know, why, why do you believe in the Bible? They'll say, well, that's how I was raised. Okay, all right, if, if you came from a God-fearing home, I, that, that's probably, that's how I was raised. Or they'll say, well, it changed my life. All right, good. But I want to give you a little more information today. I want to give you a, 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 another arrow in your quiver, so to speak, as you go out and you begin to witness about the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that there, there's two types of revelation. There's one called general revelation. General revelation is what we get through nature, Romans 1.20. You know, um, the, uh, Psalm talks about the heavens declare the glory of God. The earth is his handiwork. Creation, I believe, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. I believe the entire Bible, and I believe God spoke and this world began. Ex nihilo creation. Out of nothing, he created this world. And it's a beautiful world that he created. And his world was good. And I believe 100% that God created this world. I am created. I see that. I watched it when my kids were born. And I see the miracle of birth. I mean, it was just tremendous. And I understand DNA, and I understand how the body works. And it's just fascinating how this world works. And I'm not going to believe for a second it was by accident. It wasn't by accident. Look around at this world. General revelation. And then there's special revelation. Special revelation is what we get through Scripture. It's also what we get through the truth, through the supernatural, the resurrection of Christ, the miracles, the prophecy. It, it's a special revelation that God gives to us. He breathes it into us. But I want us to talk today about something called the doctrine of revelation. Now, that's not revelation as in the book of Revelation, which I, I've taught through that before, and if you ever missed that, go back and to our website or go back and catch those messages. But the doctrine of revelation is a revelation that says it's revealing of information and knowledge about how God has revealed himself. See, in other words, I want you to understand how important the Bible is. The Bible is just not a book. The Bible is just not a, a bunch of nice words. The Bible is not something that, um, you know, um, uh, Charles Heston reads to you now and then. Have you ever heard of that? The Bible is the living, breathing word of God. And I want you to have confidence in the accuracy of the Bible. I want you to have confidence in the fact that when we read the Bible, it's inspired by God. Every word is inspired by God. And you might not understand why every word's in the Bible. Sometimes I wonder why, why did God give us the giant census numbers and numbers? Why did God give us some of the stories that, that he gave? But it's inspired by God for us to, to, to be taught. And we have to realize the Bible is a real book. It's a real item. I've used this, uh, I've used this story before, and, and you, some of you have seen this illustration. Some of you who have ever repelled, if you're ever in the Marine Corps or, or something like that, you've repelled. Or, uh, and, and repelling is interesting. I remember I was down at Paris Island, and, and they invited us to go up the repelling tower down there, and, and uh, you hooked that line up. And this is not me. This was someone who went before us. But you hooked that line up around you, and you're up there about 100 feet, and they say, all you need to do is go to the edge, and put your toes there and just kind of lean back. And when you lean back, whoa, you can feel that baby sucking up you know, into you. And you think, oh, my land. And they just walk down the wall. <laughs> you just walk down the wall. Yeah, right, come on. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a feeling. I mean, when you lean back and all of a sudden you realize there's nothing there except you're holding on to a rope, you trust in that rope. You trust in that harness that somebody put you in because that is your life right there. The Bible is trustworthy. Don't let anybody, don't let anyone say for a minute that you cannot trust the Word of God. You can trust the Word of God. 
And I bring this up because there's a lot of college professors. There's a lot of academia now. Now, I did the story of a young man who went to college, and he was a Bible-believing Christian. And the first thing his professor did, he, he got him there. And he said, you know what? He said, the Bible's not true because you can't scientifically prove it. He said, the Bible fails the test of scientific observation. We're moving on. And that student didn't know what to say. He had no, no idea what to say. And he went home thinking that he had been lied to because his professor said, you can't use scientific observation to prove the Bible. And you know, he's right. You can't. Because scientific observation calls for something that, well, has to be observable, has to be measurable, and you have to be able to do it again. That's not the Bible. But what we have to realize is the Bible, we need to look at and know its historicity. And that's what we're emphasizing today. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Peter here is saying, this is God's word. You know, this big fisherman from, from the Sea of Galilee who was a tough guy. I think Peter was physically a, a tough kind of guy. And I think Peter's kind of a brute almost a little bit when you, when you see him described in Scripture. He had a miraculous change. He went from being that fisherman who denied Christ to now that apostle who said, I do not deserve to be put to death the same way my Lord was. And I will never recap my story because I saw the power of the resurrection. I saw the risen Christ and I believe in that. And he said, now I want you to know his word. Look at what he says. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him, the majestic glory, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. And he's talking about the baptism of Christ when, when the heavens opened up and God spoke and said, this is my beloved son. See, this is for, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter said, look, I was an eyewitness. We were eyewitnesses, James and John and Jude. We were all eyewitnesses. And all of you here, we are witnesses to this. If you would go to, uh, to England today, and you would stand near the Tower of London, that's where this picture was taken, you would see what remains of the Roman Wall, which originally was built to protect London. The Romans came under a guy by the name of Julius Caesar, it was about 54 BC, and they took Rome from the Britons, and, and they, or I'm sorry, they took England from the Britons, and they, they claimed that it was Roman now. Well, how do we know Julius Caesar actually was a guy that did that? How do we know it wasn't someone else? It's historicity. See, to look back in history, there's a couple things you need. And I know this because I, 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 I teach history. I mean, history has been my, my subject for a number of years. You know, my, my, my sister, who has a lot more intelligence, a lot more smarts than I do, I mean, she went into the medical field. She was very good at it, a professional at that. I, I, I was able to go into history. You know, and so how do I know about history? Well, I know, one, that history is built on eyewitnesses. You cannot have a true historical event if there, any, if there aren't any eyewitnesses. Two, you need early sources. So in other words, if we're talking about the Romans being in Britain, and we're talking about the Roman wall being built by a guy by the name of Julius Caesar, we better have eyewitnesses who actually were there. And they better have written that story down early. And when I say early, I mean they better have written it down within about 100 years or so of that. They're considered early sources. And third, you need independent attestations. You need somebody who wasn't a Roman, someone who was a Briton saying, you know what, these Romans came and they built that wall. And I watched them build that wall. I watched them slay our brothers as they built that wall. Now, you can put some credit into that and say it's historical because it has eyewitnesses, it has early sources, early eyewitnesses who wrote it down, and it has independent attestations. The Word of God was written by 40 different writers, many of which didn't even know each other. It was written in three different languages that spanned across three different continents, from Africa to what would be Asia to Europe. These men had different occupations. They had different writing styles. That's why you know, some were a little more educated than others. Luke was a very educated man. He was a physician. He had, he had well-versed Greek compared to what John might have had, or Matthew might have had, or heaven forbid, Peter. You know, that fisherman, he probably didn't have a whole lot of, of fancy words that he used. Again, many of these men didn't even know each other. But the thing is, this, it was written over 1,500 years. 
So we start to go back and see, well, what scripture really made of 40 different writers, three different languages, spanned three continents, 1,500 years, again, written by men who many of them didn't even know each other. A few of them did. Some of them were contemporaries a little bit. You know, in the New Testament, maybe a little bit. John, you know, Matthew, but the writers of the Old Testament, some of them were hundreds of years apart from Ezekiel to Daniel or from Jeremiah to Hezekiah or, or Jonah. It's important for us to understand that. Now, I have taken many tours down to, down to Gettysburg. I love going down to Gettysburg. I, I, I just, my daughter and I went down there last year. We, we had a great time walking the battlefield and, and doing things. And, and I like to tell little stories that I've learned about Gettysburg. How do we know what happened at Pickett's Charge? Well, we don't know it by some guy who works at McDonald's and says, yeah, this is what Pickett's Charge went, blah, blah, blah. We know it by eyewitnesses. We know it because the guys in the 33rd Virginia who were attacking the guys in the 61st Pennsylvania who were holding the stone wall. They wrote their stories down after the war. They wrote letters home and said, this is what I saw. I saw the cannons from Little Round Top raining destruction down upon the far left of the Virginia line. I saw the North Carolina unit collapse under inflating fire from the 1st Minnesota. I, and then the guy said, I was in the 1st Minnesota, and we went right out into that. See, now you can put the Battle of Gettysburg together, especially pick its charge, because you have eyewitnesses. You have early sources, and you had independent attestations. Confederates and Union and townsfolk all said, this is what we saw. So we know that. See, eyewitnesses change everything. Eyewitnesses change everything. And I want to tell you something. When someone says, why do you believe in the Bible? You can say, well, I was raised to believe in it. Good. And you can say, it changed my life because I pray it did. If you were a, a real believer in Christ, it did change your life, or it should be changing your life. But I want you to realize, you know what? When someone asks me, why do I believe in the Bible? I stand and I say, the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. In other words, you say there were eyewitnesses there. Something happened at that tomb. Something happened that they put a man who said he was God's son into that tomb. They sealed that. They had a Roman guard of almost 40 men, 40 professional soldiers standing there. They said, nobody touches this tomb. And on the third day, that tomb was empty. And Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And he spoke to 500, at least 500. And those Roman soldiers came up with a story. Something happened at that tomb. And we have to realize what happened at that tomb changed our life. Because that means now that we were lost in our trespasses and sins. We are now, we can now be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because eyewitness changed everything. Paul, Peter, John, James, Thomas, Matthew, they saw the risen Christ. And it changed their life. We need to read the Bible with that type of confidence, that type of spirit, and say, man, that's what we want. That's the power we stand on. When someone says, well, you can't prove it because you can't redo it. I have the eyewitnesses. I have the eyewitnesses right here in this book. Yeah, but they're, they're eyewitnesses. They're early sources. And there's all types of independent attestations. That is a history book. And not only does it give history, it gives a doctrine because it's a voice of God itself. See, we need to stand firm. We need to have a little power behind what we do. Look what Luke says. When we talk about, remember, Luke is going to write the book of Luke, he's going to write Acts. He's going to write about the Acts of the Apostles, which basically is, is what the early church did. What happened, you know, um, after the ascension of Christ and, and, and what happened at Pentecost and, and how the, the church went out, the apostles went out and be able to preach and do miracles in the Lord Jesus' name. In so much as having undertaken to compile a narrative, a history, basically. So Luke says, I, I have not seen Christ. But I want to write a history about those who have seen him. In other words, Luke said, I don't think this real resurrection thing occurred. I don't think this guy really was God's son, but I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to write a history about it. And I'm going to talk to everybody I can talk to. And I'm going to compile, compile whether I think it's true or not. Just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word had delivered them to us. Now us. Now something happened that Luke considers himself a believer. 
So in other words, when you read of that, you realize, wow, Luke was talking to Matthew. He was talking to John. He was talking to Peter. He was talking to James. And all of a sudden, he realized, man, you guys are serious, aren't you? He was talking to Mary. He was talking to Mary Magdalene. And he was talking to people in Jerusalem. And then he's, wow, I have to deal with this because this is a huge decision. And he said, now I want to embrace this. I want to accept this because, man, I believe. I believe that that man who said, I am the son of God who was crucified in Jerusalem, and everyone who praised his name a week earlier, cursed his name now, rose from the dead, and Luke said, I have to deal with that in my life, because I want to spend an eternity with God, because he is the Messiah who has been promised, and now I realize that. It seemed good to me, having followed all things closely for some time. See, Luke was watching everything, an educated man. You know, he was a physician. He was watching everything that went on, and look what he said, I will now write an orderly account for you, my most excellent Theophilus. In other words, I've seen it. I've talked to the eyewitnesses. Man, I buy into this. This is, this is real. This is God's son who is now living. And the neat thing about when you talk about the eyewitnesses, I don't know if you ever read this or not, but, but I, was, I was reading this a little bit the other day. It didn't really caught me because of the title of the message. When Paul was writing to Timothy, and Timothy was now the pastor at Ephesus, the belief is, and he was a young pastor. See, John founded the church at Ephesus, and then, and then John was, was moving on, and, 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 we, and Timothy was coming in, and, and this young guy's taking over the church now. And, and, and also, look, look, what, look what Paul says to him. Paul says, okay, I'm writing to you in Ephesus. Watch this guy, Alexander the coppersmith. So Alexander the coppersmith was this guy who lived in Ephesus. And he's telling, now this guy's still living there. And he's telling Timothy, hey, you watch this Alexander the coppersmith guy. He did me great harm. Paul says, he, I don't know what he did. I don't know if he came after Paul or, or what it might have been. But Paul said, man, you've got to watch this guy. Both eyes on him. Right there, be watching him all the time. Because this guy is a little stinky somewhere. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. In other words, Paul said, don't, don't take up in vengeance against him, but watch him. God's going to take care of him. God, God will get even with him, for he strongly opposed our message. In other words, it's eyewitnesses who are there talking about other eyewitnesses. This gives the Bible that much more credibility. Because now Paul said, Timothy, watch the guy down the street. He's down maybe in the corner of, of Fifth and Elm. And it's just Alexander the Coppersmith guy. Alexander the Coppersmith would have been well known in Ephesus. People could have easily come out and said, well, there is no Alexander the Coppersmith. No, he was there. It's an eyewitness. It verifies that truth. See, eyewitnesses were present at the time of the writing. Eyewitnesses were there. In other words, what Paul is telling Timothy, watch out for certain people. And those people are still hanging around right now. Those people could have easily said, I never heard of that Paul guy. I never knew this Paul guy. I did. But see, they never did. It verifies that truth of Scripture. And some people will say, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I might give you the idea there's eyewitnesses, but you can't find any early sources. You can't tell me there's any early manuscripts about Scripture. Show me the original book of Isaiah. Show me the original book that, that, that uh, Joshua wrote about the, the capture of, uh, of the promised land. I want to see the original book that John wrote about when he was on the island of Patmos in Revelation. Folks, we have to understand. There was, we have a lot of early or early manuscripts. There was a, 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 something discovered in Egypt in 1920. We call it Ryland's Papyrus. It was, it was papyrus, which was the Egyptian paper that was found. But the neat thing is, we consider it the oldest New Testament manuscript. They narrowed it down into that 25-year period because of the papyrus, because of the writing that was used. And you know what? They found the book of John, John 18, verses 31 through 33, and then when you, you found another fragment, it had verses 37 through 38. And you say to me, okay, Pastor, what's that prove? That means when you lay those pieces of Ryland's papyrus, John chapter 18 down, against John chapter 18 now in my Bible, they match 100%. So in other words, nobody tampered with Scripture. Nobody changed the stories a little bit. The, 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 the manuscripts we found from Ryland's papyrus, which we believe are the oldest manuscripts, match John 18 100%. And then we found others. 
uh, Bordermer Papyrus, which is 150, which has almost every major book of the New Testament in it, or parts of that book. Chester Beatty's Papyrus, which dates back to around 180 AD, has every book of the New Testament in it. Now, there are, there are a few chapters that, are, that have been rotted away a little bit, but it shows us the New Testament that was making its way around during the second century of Christ is the exact scripture we have today. Nobody changed it. No guy in some monastery sitting over and said, oh, I like this verse, I'm going to throw that one out of my head. No, it's the same. See, we need to look at history and say, wow, it's a historical document written by eyewitnesses who were there, talking about other eyewitnesses, and I am going to put my faith into that. Now, I also have here, and I want to show you this, 20,000, 20,000 manuscripts of the Old Testament. Now, not all of them are original. Some of them are pieces, but that's how much we have of the Old Testament. Early sources that date way back to about 100 AD. We have 6,000 pieces of the New Testament. So, and I already gave you examples of those three. But when we start to add up little fragments around here of the book of Ephesians, book of Hebrews, book of Matthew, Re Revelation, there is not one of those fragments that is different than the translation of our scripture today if you use a good translation. And I'm saying a good translation. I'm not talking about uh, a paraphrase or a paraphrase, like what the, the Message Bible is. I'm talking about um, you know, the, the English Standard Version, New American Standard Version, a word-by-word -word dynamic, dynamic translation, which I'll, I'll talk about that next week. But I want you to understand this. this. This Bible was real. It was God's spoken word. Now, some people say, well, we got a lot of early sources of a lot of other books. Okay, give me one. Well, like Aristotle. He was a Greek, you know that. <laughs> I know he was a Greek, yeah. How, much, how many originals or early manuscripts of Socrates do you have? None. Okay. How many early manuscripts of Aristotle do you have? We know he was 350 B.C. Uh, we got like 10 early manuscripts. Oh, good. What's the, what's the earliest date? The earliest date we have of Aristotle is 1,300 years after he lived. But we know he lived. Why? Because he was Greek. <laughs> See, no, 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 you gotta, you got to treat everything equally. If you're going to say we believe in Aristotle, and the oldest, oldest manuscript you have of Aristotle was 1,300 years after he died, look at the power of the New Testament with the papyrus that we have. Here's another guy, Gaelic Wars by Julius Caesar. That's how we know about the, the history of England, because Julius Caesar wrote a biography about it. He wrote his stories down. There are no originals of, of Gaelic Wars left. There's not, not even any originals of the originals of it left. The oldest, the oldest we have of the Gaelic Wars is 800 years after Caesar died. Now, all those books are considered history by every major historian in the world. But yet, those same ones will try to look at the Bible and, dis and discount it. Why? Because they have a secular worldview. Because they know that if they hold to the Bible, you have to make a decision. I either have to follow God's law or man's law. If I understand that the Bible is real, I have to realize I'm either created because I didn't evolve. I, God spoke and this world began. See, that's the power we have to realize. No work of history can claim near what the Bible can, near what it can claim. That's the power of the Bible. I like this, Matthew 28, what did Jesus say? Go ye into all the world and take the gospel into every language and tongue. Hebrew, Greek, and then it went into Aramaic. When, when, so by about, I would say, 50 AD, the Bible was already in three major languages. The New Testament was already being written in that. The, the Old Testament was, and now the New, as, as books were written, they were written either in Hebrew or Greek, and then they were right into, into Aramaic. Within 50 years, they were into Coptic. By 100 AD, we now know that the Bible was written into a fourth major language, Coptic, which is what was spoken in Egypt and Africa. Then it was in Syri as Syrian, which was spoken in the area of what would be Iraq and, and Iran. That was by about 125 AD. So right away we see the Bible was translated. And guess what? When you see fragments from Syrian, Coptic, Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew, they all say the same thing. Scripture did not change. Nobody came around around 400 AD and said, well, we're going to change all this. We're going to add this and that. No, because if you would have done that, you would have had to gone back and add it and change it in every one of these and gone back and changed it in every one of these and gone back and changed it in every one of these, and that's just stupid. 
See, I mean, nobody's really going to buy into that. The Bible was written. The Bible was God's word. All verified, the originals. And you know what really is the cream of the crop when you talk to verifying Old Testament scrolls? The Dead Sea Scrolls. A, uh, a young shepherd, 1947, was out throwing rocks, like young shepherds probably do. Hey, look, I'm going to throw a rock over here. And he threw a rock into a cave, and he heard something break. And so he threw another rock in the cave, heard something else break. Then he wandered down in the cave, and he found this, this broken jar, and it had this really old manuscript in it. So he took it, and then they found out, these are the Dead Sea Scrolls, in 11 different caves in a place called Corum, right near the Dead Sea. Dead sea. They found copies of or fragments of every, every Old Testament book, except Esther, except Esther, and they all date at least 250 years before the birth of Christ. So in other words, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Psalms, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, every copy was there. And when you match the Dead Sea Scrolls sitting right now to the Bible we have today, it matches word by word. See, that was God's word preserved it right there. Wow. Now, I'm not done. If you go to Jericho, and I've been to Jericho, and, and it's really cool, and, and I can remember the tour guide who was with us at Jericho, he said, look, look at that wall. And I'm saying, yeah, it's, it's like a wall. He said, look at the stuff in front of it. And I said, yeah, it's like bricks. And he said, what's unique about it? And I said, well, the bricks look like the same that are in the wall. He said, sure, that was the wall of Jericho, 25 foot high. What? 25 foot high? Are you serious? Yeah. 10 foot wide. What? Are you really that big? Yeah. He said, guess what? When you do an archaeological study of Jericho, how did God take the walls down? Well, the walls fell outward. Good. Look at these bricks. And when you look at the archaeology of Jericho, the walls fell outward. See, 23,000 places. 23,000 archaeological digs or finds all all support god's word all support what is written about in god's word the walls of jericho fell outward there there jerusalem was under under a siege hezekiah made this tunnel i've walked through hezekiah's tunnel i know it's there the bible said it was there powerful People said, well, we don't think Pontius Pilate was really the governor of uh, Judea, so we have to ignore the, the, uh, the story of Jesus being crucified because we think Pontius Pilate was in, was in Switzerland because Mount Pilatus is named after him. And Joel and I happened to go up there. Really? Well, because in Capernaum they found a memorial stone that had Pontius Pilate, and it had the same era, the exact same events that were going on during the time Jesus was crucified. They dated that memorial stone back to about 38 years after the death of Christ. Archaeology proves it. So the Bible is trustworthy, folks. Historicity shows us that. But we're not done. A guy by the name of uh, General George Patton. If you ever heard of, uh, heard of George Patton, here's his, uh, his statue that we have, um, that we have it. Uh, at um, West Point. And I can remember studying about Patton, and when I talked to guys who were in Patton's unit, I'd say, tell me something about Patton. When Patton spoke, it was the word of God. Really? It was the word of Almighty Patton as said. Yeah, I mean, in other words, when Patton said something, you did it. Because they said it had the power of God. That was the kind of general Patton was. But let me tell you something. The Bible is the word of God. Fact. The words of the Lord are pure words like silver refined in a furnace, on the ground purified seven times. So the psalmist says right there, the words of the Lord are pure. They are there. Well, I, I don't think God's word is really God's word. Show me it's God's word. All right, let's turn to a book called 1 Peter, where, or 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. And look what Peter said. Remember Peter's guy said that he's not a witnesses, and we're talking about this. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day until the day dawns and the morning star rises. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's interpretation. See, when you look at what Paul, what Peter is saying here, Peter is saying it is the word of God that we have. The prophetic word is God's word as spoken to the writers. As God spoke to Moses and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and he wrote to, spoke to Matthew and John and Mark, and he spoke to me, and he spoke to James, and he spoke to Jude, and he's, he's going to speak to John someday. See, that's what Peter's saying. It's not our words. 
We were driven by the Holy Spirit to write this. So in other words, you're not reading the words of Peter the fisherman. You're reading the words of God breathed into me by the Holy Spirit, and then I put them into my hand. But it's not my words. It's God's words. And look at the supernatural events. When you go to uh, uh, Garnesia, which is in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus was up there and he healed that demon act, everybody in that town knew that demon act was a nut. They knew he was a banana. They knew he was running around like, 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 like wildfire. There were eyewitnesses there. Not one eyewitness ever said, no, that Jesus guy, he never, he never, he never healed anybody. We know he did because crowds followed him. Large crowds followed him. That's the neat thing. The apostles, all the, the, the miracles they did, there's no record of them ever being disputed. Now about the man with the, wizard hand, with the withered hand in Matthew? Remember the, the Pharisees were trying to set Jesus up? They said, yeah, you, you can't heal on the Sabbath. You, 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 you think you're a big healer? We see all the crowds. You can't heal on the Sabbath. Jesus, what did he do? He looked at the man with the withered hand and said, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was healed. Just like that, it was healed. But note, note what it says in Scripture, because this is great historicity. The Pharisees went out and conspired against him on how to destroy The Pharisees knew he healed. They admitted it right there. Look at the raising of Lazarus. We were down at the, at the Holy Land Experience down in Orlando. They had this beautiful uh, uh, drama they do of, of the raising of Lazarus. And this is neat enemy attestation. See, enemy attestation adds to Scripture. It adds to historicity events because now it's the enemy who's saying this is what we saw. When Jesus healed and, and, and brought Lazarus back from the dead, when he said, Lazarus, come forth, come forth, Lazarus, look what happened. Many of the Jews who had come with Mary, had seen what he did. They believed. See, people were believing. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus, eyewitnesses. Do you know what that Jesus did? He brought this guy back from the dead. We were really wondering, who is he? Could he be that Messiah? He can bring people back to the dead. That doesn't happen. Well, we're gonna, it doesn't happen. I can imagine the word that was going around Bethany and the word that was going around Jerusalem. That's why the crowds were waiting for him when he came in on, on Palm Sunday. And look at the Pharisees said, what are we going to do for this man is performing many signs? Enemy out of station. This guy is doing a lot of stuff. This guy is doing a lot of miracles. We've got to do something about it. The best one. The best one comes right here. When Jesus was risen from the dead, those guards, remember I said there's about 40 of them at least. There weren't just one or two. They, were, they weren't like loser guards who were hanging there doing nothing else. You know, they were real trained. So that had, to, that had the seal of Rome right on. Nobody touched that. But look what happened. When Jesus Christ rose from them, what did the guards do? While they were going, behold, some of the guards went into the city. And they told the chief priests what happened. Then they, then they told the elders. They took counsel. They gave a sufficient amount of money to the soldiers. They said, hey, what we want you guys to do, see, they're admitting the tomb's empty. We want you guys to say those big brute disciples, those professional wrestling disciples, those big monsters, they came and they beat you up. What? Yeah, they must be really tough. Oh, yeah, those, those disciples, that Peter guy who denied Jesus and ran, all those powerful disciples, only one of them stood there when Christ was crucified. I mean, the others all of a sudden got a lot of oof. And they got military training, and they like zapped them like seals and took the, took the guards out? Come on. But what did they say? Tell them that they came and beat you up. Oh, and how do we know that's true? Because Roman history says it. When you read Tatticus and you read Josephus, who are two guys who, who we know all Roman history about, because they wrote it, and they were early sources, they were eyewitnesses, what did they say? They put the story of the empty tomb in both of their histories of Rome. Both of them say... Well, there was this rabbi who stirred up people in Jerusalem by saying he was God's son. They crucified him, and then his followers came and took his body at night. They admit the tomb is empty. The room, the most powerful nation on earth, admitted the tomb is empty. So you can be a college professor and say, you can't prove scientifically. I don't need to because history has. History has proven that God spoke and his son was risen from the dead, just as scripture prophesied. And by the way, so does the Jewish history in the Talmud, and so does Greek history and Lucius of Samsara, who are both historians. Uh, Lucius was a Greek historian writing at the exact same time that Tatticus wrote. Early sources say something happened to Jerusalem. That tomb is empty. 
the fulfillment of prophecy, folks. I mean, that, we're building a pretty strong case here. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6, when you read that, read that on your own sometime. What happened about 54 AD? What did Jesus do? He went and talked to the 12. He talked to uh, James and John. He talked to over 500. 1 Corinthians says he spoke to 500. Some of them were up around the Sea of Galilee. And the neat thing is, when you read it, it says many are still alive today. So in other words, what Paul is saying is, this is what Jesus did. There's eyewitnesses. Ask them. Ask them. You never have one story of someone saying, I never saw that. But you have all kinds of stories of people saying, I saw the risen Christ. I saw the risen Christ. And guess what? Those people were willing to die for it because that's what Saul did for a living. Saul, who changed his name to Paul, killed believers for a living. That's what he did. He hunted them down and he would say, confess it's a lie. Not one ever confessed. And then Jesus spoke to Saul on the road to Damascus. And Saul realized, wow, you are the risen Christ. I have a decision to make. There is the risen Christ. Each of us have a decision to make. What are we going to build our life on? The word of God, biblical, world, biblical point of view, or the secular world? And I love this one. I love this one. I know we're getting time late here, but i got, I got to get this one quick. This is so good. I love preaching on Psalm 22. If you know that, if you've been here on a Good Friday service, you know that. I, I, I remember the crimson worm. I, it's powerful. But I'm, let me tell you why it's so powerful. When Jesus was on the cross, he gave seven sayings. One of the sayings was this. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sebastian. And you say, well, what the heck does that mean? It means, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? That's Jesus crying out from the cross, my God. Why have thou forsaken me? And you say, okay, what's, what's so big about that, Pastor? Well, let me tell you, first of all, that's in Psalm 22. But see, at the time, it wasn't called Psalm 22. Because, see, when the Jewish scriptures were written, there wasn't a, a chapter and verse. Chapter and verse didn't come around until probably about the 1300s. A guy by the name of uh, John Huss began to do that. The only way they would have known was because Psalm 22 wasn't called Psalm 22. It was called, my God, my God. So when Jesus Christ is crying out from the cross, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Jews would have been able to say, my God, my God. We have a psalm named that. Here it says, and guess what? As Jesus was crying out that psalm, when you read through Psalm 22, everything that was going on during the crucifixion was proph prophesied to the direct point a thousand years before. He would be put between two thieves. His blood is, would be poured out like water, but not a bone would be broken. So when Jesus said, my God, my God, he's telling the Jews, read Psalm. Read the book of Psalm because here I am. Here is the Messiah. Here I am. Wow. That's prophecy. That is prophecy. What a tremendous Bible we have because we serve a tremendous God. Fact three as we close here. Um, many of you might have seen this a little bit, but you know, we have lights on today. You have lights at your house. You know, I, 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 can, I can see my beautiful wife because she's lit up. I, I can see her in the light. Thanks, Thomas Edison, because if not, I have to hold a candle. Is that really you? But I don't have to. I can see her when it when lights up. Thomas Edison changed her life. Didn't he? he changed my life. Because when he brought electricity in with that without light bulb, we can now see things, right? The Bible, the Bible will change your life. All scripture is God breathed. What that means is all scripture was exhaled from the mouth of God into the mind of John, and John wrote the exact words of God. Now, Maybe John wrote it a little bit in his style. Maybe John didn't use the best, best, best wording at times. I mean, in other words, maybe he didn't have the best uh, Jewish at times. Maybe he used if, and, what's and what. But he wrote the words as Scripture told him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, that's the Word of God. And it's used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that we can do the good work of God. God gave us his word. And when you read the Bible, it's God's word you're reading. Understand that. It's the word of the one true God. See, unbelievers are lost. It's a fact, folks. 
Your friends of yours who are unbelievers who are saying, eh, I don't have time for church. I don't need this stuff. I got too many things to worry about. They are lost because the wages of sin is death. You see, the gift of God's eternal life. And see, 1 Corinthians tells us the natural person, the, uh, the unbeliever, that's what it's saying there to understand that. The unbeliever does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. That's why people say, oh, abortion, come on, who cares? It's just a thing. Slay it. Slay it. Nah, don't worry about it. Don't even think twice about it. That's why they're saying, we don't need God around. Get him out of the school. Get him out of your life. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you're dead. Do whatever you want. You hear that all the time. Oh, you're one of them Bible thumpers. I don't got time for you, man. I would have my own fun. All right. You do not accept the things of God. For they are folly to them. They make fun of them. And that's going to happen. We're going to get it more and more. I have people who make fun of me because I believe in creation. That's all right. That's okay. I have teachers in school who say, we can't believe that you believe in creation. I mean, come on, you're a nut. I believe in creation. I believe God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Call me whatever you want. That's all right. But see, to them, it's folly. To them, they can care less. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, they've tuned him out. But us, if we are a spiritual man, and that's what the word scripture uses here, that means we're a believer. For by the grace of God, we're saved through faith. See, you're saved through your faith, not your works. You're saved and you put your faith, not, not in me as a pastor, but you put it in God that he raised his son from the dead. And Jesus Christ paid our sin debt, was the atonement for our sin. And that God spoke on the third day and Christ was risen from the dead. And now he says, live as in Christ lives in you. See, that's it. Now we are his workmanship created for Christ Jesus to do good works. Yeah, we're created to do good works, right? God's prepared us. See, now faith is the assurance. The faith is the assurance of things hoped for and conviction of things not seen. Jenny is going for a major surgery this week. Jenny says, God, you have this. God, you have it. That's blessing my heart right here to say that. We're going to go through some tough stuff. Some of you are going through tough stuff right now. But when you put God at the helm, you say, God, you have this. Because I believe in you. I have faith in you. God, I have faith in you that I'm not going to try to make my own decisions. I'm not living by my own. I'm living by you. For every good gift, every perfect gift is a gift from God. It comes down from the Father of light. See, that's what we have to understand. When, when, you, when you read scripture about marriage, about husbands having roles, about wives, about honoring God, it's God's word. It's proven to be God's word. Eyewitnesses, early sources, enemy attestation, archaeology, prophecy. You can deny it all you want, but I'm going to tell you one thing. One thing will happen. We will all stand before God someday. The evidence of transformation in our life is that we allow God to run our life and make our decisions. And we all, who when veiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed. I pray that this series has helped transform your life. I pray that it's taken your heart and said, you know what? I want you to be a real believer. I want you to live for me. I want you to live for me to the point that, man, you want to be so full, you're just overflowing. See, that's God. It's not about, uh, it's, it's not about, you know, someone having a bunch of little laws and trying to cramp your style. It's not about someone slinging out things and saying, you can't do this. No, God said, I want to live in you. I want to have the power in you. I want to breathe into you. The same way I breathed into scripture. And guess what? He can. Because you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Guess who lives in you? The Holy Spirit. See, God has breathed into you. Wow. That's the idea that we have. And I have a picture of a lion here. Not one of those kind of Jaffa Circus lions that just away there. This is a real lion. And you know, if I have a real lion, I don't have to say, he has big teeth. He got big paws. He's going he's gonna to rip you up. All I have to do is unleash him and say, get him! <laughs> and you'll see the power of that lion. You don't need to defend the lion. You just turn it loose. You don't need to stand here and defend the Bible, even though I gave you a lot of information about it. Turn it loose. Turn the Bible loose in your life. See the Lord Jesus Christ has done it in your life. Have a transformed life. I've been crucified with Christ. It's not Phil that lives now. It's Christ that lives in Phil. Spent a lot of my life screwing up. Spent a lot of my life doing stupid things. Spent a lot of my life being a disappointment to a lot of people. But now I want to be transformed by the power of God. Now I want to say, all right, God, it's all you. It's not me. 
Whatever happens, it's you. You have this. And now, in the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. That's transformation. That's developing a heart for God. Let's stand and let's, uh, let's close with uh, we'll close with prayer. If all of us stand, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Stand before him. Lord, I thank you that the Bible is real. I thank you that I don't need to just say, well, I hope I go to heaven. I know I can go to heaven by accepting you as Lord of my life. Lord, I pray that each of us will have a heart that's transformed. We're not going to be perfect, Lord. We're still going to fall short. We're still going to have transgressions. We still have that natural man that wants to come out of us. But, Lord, I pray that we will each be able to have, be open and have a transformed life so that we can stand here and say, no matter what comes down, I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It is well with my soul because you are mine and I am yours. And now you live in me because I am crucified. That's a big statement. Lord, thank you for everyone who's here today. Keep us safe as we go home. I pray the word of God will touch each of us. Give us the power to share this message with other folks and be positive this week as we go forward in the living, breathing name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you, God, breathed into scripture, we pray now that the Holy Spirit will be breathed out of us, that we can be a witness for you. In Jesus Christ's holy name, we pray and thank you, Lord. Amen.